All right, everybody, I am so excited to be here today. We are going to join me, I'm Linda with Salty Seattle, in my colorful world of possibilities. So what you see here in front of me is all pasta dough that has been naturally dyed using vegetables, herbs, and superfoods. And I go beyond the dough to create sort of beautiful, whimsical pasta creations that I turn into awesome, awesome things that uh, are also good for you. And so the real benefit is to um, is the fact that it's, you know, colorful, it's fun, it's delightful, and it's playful. But behind that, it actually has a little bit more nutritional value to it than standard pasta. So I am going to jump in and we're going to make a couple of different colors for you. And then we're going to make that into some awesome, cool pasta shapes and creations here in the next hour or so. But before we do that, I want to run through what some of the colors are that we have in front of us to start with. Um, so I'm going to start with red. You'll see we have kind of an incomplete rainbow and then a couple extra colors down here. So I will start with red. Uh, the red pasta is made from beets. And then moving on to orange, um, peppers or carrots make a really great orange. I also like to use a sort of pepper paste. Um, and in this particular instance, I used a Calabrian chili paste that was bright, bright orange and made this nice pasta. And so one of the questions I get all the time is can you taste the flavors behind the colors? And I would say that appreciably, once you put sauce on most of these, you really can't taste very much of anything. However, the orange does continue to have a little bit of a kick to it just because it is those sort of spicy peppers. And I like to play that up with the sauce that I would pair this particular pasta with. And this is not just plain pasta here. This is actually yellow that I color with turmeric root. And I use the whole turmeric root rather than turmeric powder because it's really nice, vibrant, yellow, fresh. And because it is the fresh turmeric root, it has actually more bioavailability of the nutrients in the turmeric. Green, I'm going to show you um, on camera. So we're gonna do a little placeholder here for green. Um, you may have noticed our bowl of spinach, spoiler alert, that's what we'll be doing for the green. Um, the blue comes from these awesome flowers that are native to Southeast Asia called butterfly pea flowers. Um, they're super cool. They're really trending right now in mixology um, and in dessert making even um, because they're pH reactive. And all you do is just steep these flowers. In fact, actually, I ordered um, some from Amazon that just arrived today. I'm going to come right back to the frame. But I just wanted to show you what those flowers wind up looking like. You come, they come in a little, little package that looks just like that. And the flowers are dried. And they're just these dried flowers like so. Uh, and then you just steep them in hot water. And the longer you steep them, the more blue they become. And because they are pH reactive, what I mean by that is if you put them with something acidic, uh, like lemon juice or vinegar, uh, then they'll kind of go more toward the purplish pink side. Whereas if you keep them basic, then they will uh, lend themselves more to staying with a true, true blue. Um, and then we have a purple here. And this purple is actually made from beets mixed with blueberries. However, um, I'm also going to demonstrate a really cool, almost more fuchsia-y purple um, for us on camera today. And then finally coming over to, this is just plain pasta dough, and then this one is a black colored pasta dough, and that is made using activated charcoal. And I love to use um, this coconut um, activated charcoal. Um, it is very, very benign. Um, and a lot of people talk about the health benefits and both um, and also the health risks of charcoal. And a lot of people say that um, they do use it medically because uh, medicines will bind to it. So it's kind of um, removes toxins. Um, but the concern for people that I often hear is that, oh, if I eat activated charcoal, I don't want the medicines I'm taking to not be effective in my body. And I just immediately like to nip that right in the bud because when you use it for pasta, you are using such a minuscule parts per million of it that it doesn't have any impact on that. So I actually do with the black, just use it for the color. There's no health or flavor or, or medical counter indications to using it um, in such minuscule quantities. Um, just something I like to cover. Uh, so 
I want to jump into making a couple of colors with you, and then we will weave them into a beautiful fabric of pasta here in a moment. So I'm going to just move my pasta dough forward. Oh, and I forgot to mention, I love questions, you guys, love questions. So if anything comes to mind during, um, during this live stream, please feel free to shout it out, and I would absolutely be very, very happy to answer it. Chances are, if you're thinking it, other people are wondering the same thing. So, so I'm just going to show you how um, initially I start to create the colors. So I have my blender here, and in the well of the blender, I am just starting with some spinach. Now, green pasta dough really is one of the easier colors to make because there is so much green around us in the entire world. You can literally use anything to make green. Um, you can use parsley, you can use chard, you can use um, broccolini, you can use all sorts of greens. Um, and one of my favorite things to do in the springtime is actually if you have gardener friends or you garden yourselves, to take all of those things grow, you know, from like the parsley, that's a very light sort of almost stop light green uh, on up through the kale, which is a very, very dark green. And I'll make the entire spectrum of pasta out of all of those colors. And it's interesting to see sort of just the various nuances and shades that you get. I'm using spinach today because I had it. Um, and also because it does give a very nice middle of the road green. So I just started with um, about two cups of spinach. Uh, pasta making is not an exact science, it's an art. And so what I'm doing right now is essentially um, creating the color that I want. So I'm gonna blend this up and I'm gonna look at the blender and I'm gonna look at the shade in the blender. Oop. Um, and uh, if I like that color, that's the color I'm gonna go for. So I'm just going to mix that spinach with four eggs here. And then we will blend that right up. So you can do this if you have a blender like I do, you could do this in the blender, um, but you also can do it if you have just a hand blender, a stick or an immersion blender. Um, and then some blenders are more high powered than others. Uh, and that's totally fine if the blender doesn't get all the chunks of spinach or kale or whatever you're mixing all the way pulverized and pureed, then rather than pour it into the flour um, directly, you can just pour it through a strainer and that kind of, that helps with that. So I'm just gonna pull my blender into frame here and put the lid on and just blend it up. I apologize in advance for the noise. Just gonna give that a minute. Step back so it's not super loud. So we have a question. Someone asked if I ever use squid ink for black pasta. And squid ink is the traditional way of making black pasta when you're in Italy. It's called nero di sepia. Uh, and it is fantastic. It's very commonly used in Liguria, which is a region that uh, is along the Mediterranean. Um, but the reason for using squid ink is because they then typically will turn pasta colored with squid ink into seafood pasta preparations. And I think that that's absolutely fantastic, but you do really sort of taste that kind of pungent, sea-like, salty, briny taste. And it does really lend itself very well to, to the sea and to um, seafood pasta. If you're wanting a black color, but you're not necessarily wanting to do the seafood preparation or take it down that line, then that's where the activated charcoal comes in because it's benign and you don't taste the flavor at all. So I think both have their place. I just tend to use activated charcoal more commonly, again, because I'm going for sort of a, a neutrality in flavor. So we talked earlier about, I just kind of grabbed a handful of spinach and I put it in there and I mentioned, this is not rocket science, you know, I'm just gonna add green until I like the color in the blender. And so this color here, which I think you can um, see on the handy dandy, overhead cam there um, is a fantastic color. I love it. So I'm just going to go ahead and stick with that color. I'm not going to add any more spinach into the mix here. Um, and so then let's just move the blender aside here for a moment. Step two is to pour that into, um, I'm going to make a little bit of a well of flour 
And I have this in a bowl. You actually can just go ahead and put your flour directly on the surface. None of these vegetable colors will stain your surface because they're vegetables. That's the good news. Um, but I like to start in a bowl just because it keeps things a little cleaner initially. And I just, I love the look of that, pouring that beautiful, vibrant puree into the flour there. So rule of thumb, is that you'll use about two thirds of a cup of liquid, whether that liquid comes from eggs, from your color that you add into your eggs, or even water, to two and a quarter cups of flour. So two thirds cup of liquid, whatever the liquid is, to two and a quarter cups of flour. Um, and so the great thing about this is we have our liquid mixture and we have our flour. If it winds up that I need a little bit more flour, I can put a little bit more flour in when I start needing that. I'm just going to give this Vitamix um, blender bowl a quick rinse out because in addition to making the green, I want to make um, that fuchsia color that we talked about. So I don't want the green to stick on my blender. So we'll just get that ready for when we jump over to um, our next color. Okay, so now... I'm just going to stir this into my flour, incorporating all of that beautiful, beautiful green until it becomes kind of a sort of shaggy dough ball. There's no overt big pools of the liquid puree anymore, but it's not quite the end resulting dough that we were wanting. And Normally, if I were just making one color, at this point, I would turn this out onto my surface and I would start kneading it. However, I mentioned I wanted to make that fuchsia. So I'm actually gonna set this aside for a moment. We're gonna make our second color uh, and then we'll knead them both so that I only have to get my hands dirty once. Okay, so let's talk about this awesome color. So this is, I hope that the overhead camera can see that really well. Um, this is dragon fruit powder and you can order this on Amazon. I think it's, I think it's linked actually below um, this live stream, dragon fruit powder. So I remember the first time um, I discovered dragon fruit as a crazy color because there's dragon fruit that is white flesh and then there's dragon fruit that is fuchsia flesh like this. And I was on vacation somewhere tropical and um, I found a dragon fruit and I do weird things like try to make gnocchi in hotel rooms all the time. So I found this dragon fruit and um, I bought some flour and I sort of mashed up and incorporated the dragon fruit into the flour. And then um, I actually got the ironing board out in the hotel room and then um, <laughs> made kind of a big surface on the top of the ironing board with, um, with things that I sort of cobbled together. And then I rolled um, gnocchi right along there and it made just the coolest, coolest color ever. But I found myself back in the States and I went to the store to try to buy a dragon fruit to recreate this. And a dragon fruit, one single one of the fruits was like $15 or something crazy. Meanwhile, I've just come from a place where dragon fruit was like 50 cents for one. Um, and so as a result of that, I discovered thankfully that you can order dragon fruit powder, which is this stuff. So, um, so that is now what I make the pasta out of instead of buying really expensive dragon fruits all the time. Um, so same process as we did with our spinach pasta. Just um, crack some eggs right into the blender. And then with the dragon fruit powder, I just add until I like the color. Again, same thing. So I'm going to start with about two tablespoons and then we'll blend that up and see what it looks like. So the dragon fruit powder actually has a tendency to be a little bit um, more dense. I think that like spinach has a lot of water content. The dragon fruit, since it's a powder, does not. So I'm actually gonna add about a tablespoon of actual water in there just to kind of make um, this mixture be able to blend up very supply. And then we will pull our blender back in here and Get that rolling, where's my lid, there it is. Okay. Okay, so since it's powder, it blends up quite a bit easier. And again, if you don't have a blender, just a hand blender would work, but with the dragon fruit powder, 
fruit powder. You could even just use a whisk or a spoon. So let's look at that. What do we think? Let's check that out in the overhead and make sure that you can see that color. And I love it. I think it's great. I think it's very, very pink. I'm just gonna go with though, just to bring a little bit more vibrancy to it, one more spoon. So this, I always tell my students, experiment in the well of the blender. If you like the color in the blender, you will like the color of the resulting pasta. But if you're not 100% happy with this color, add a little bit more of whatever your color ingredient was until you are happy with it, because by the time you mix it with the flour, it is too late. So I'm just gonna blend up a teeny bit more and I think that'll just make it a little bit more, just have a little bit more pop. All right, let's take a look at that. Yes, I'm very happy. I'm, I'm much happier with that beautiful dragon fruit color. And while I have you on the overhead camera, I just want you to see how pretty this looks when we pour this into our bowl. I love this. I've always wanted to do kind of like a cocktail thing right here where I really raise it up high and go down low. And it would be super awesome to be able to do a behind the back, but um, alas, I don't think that's just not gonna happen yet unless I go to mixology school, apparently. Um, okay, so same thing as we did with our spinach dough. Just gonna mix that color into the flour until it's nice and incorporated. And again, kind of that shaggy mess where there's not a whole lot of liquid left, but it isn't a, a unified dough ball just yet. So we are about there and we're looking good. So we've got our two colors and I'm just gonna make a little bit of room for myself so that we can knead this pasta out. And so before I turn this out onto my floured surface, I'm gonna take some flour and put that down in front of me. And I'm going to be doing, let's do the dragon fruit first, and then we will do the spinach. So what I am doing here, and I'm showing you kind of the by hand uh, instructions for this, uh, you actually can make quicker work of if you have either a stand mixer or a food processor. Um, I like to show people by hand because that helps you sort of get the feel of what the ultimate consistency is supposed to be like. Um, and also because it really, it isn't that hard to do it by hand. Um, but ultimately, you know, if you are making all six colors and you also have to get dinner together that night after you worked all day, um, you can save yourself a little bit of time by using a um, blender or a food processor. So just gonna knead that together. So if you're doing this by hand, I'm going to, um, we're going to kind of through the magic of the digital live stream, go a little bit faster um, than I uh, typically would at home. Um, if you are doing this by hand, though, you really do kind of want to need and give it um, about 20 minutes. Um, and so as it continues to stick to your hand a little, anytime you feel a sticky part, just put a little bit more flour on your hands and a little bit more flour on the ball of dough. And then as you knead, here's a kneading technique for you. You will pull the dough toward yourself kind of with both hands and then push away from yourself with the heel of your hand. So toward with both, away with the heel, toward with both, away with the heel, and then one other thing you'll notice in my kneading is that every time I'm doing a quarter turn rotation on the dough. And the reason I'm doing that quarter turn rotation is that if I didn't and I just kept pulling toward and away and toward and away and toward and away, then I would wind up with just sort of a dough tube like that. But instead, I want a dough ball. So hence the quarter turn to kind of keep it in line shape-wise. So we're just gonna set that one aside. Again, I did not give it quite long enough, but I don't want you to have to sit here and watch me knead all day long. Um, so I'm gonna jump over to the green. But before I do that, 
I'm going to use a bench scraper. Bench scraper will become your best friend for pasta making. This is absolutely a tool that you very much want to invest in. It's very inexpensive. In fact, I, again, I think we have one linked below, um, but I will just use the bench scraper to get all of that pink up and all of those chunks up so that when I need the green now, I actually have um, a space to be able to do it and I don't transfer the color. Same thing with my hands. I'm just gonna kind of use the bench scraper to get most of that fuchsia off of my hands so that I don't transfer the color. Okay, we'll call that good enough. And same thing, so sprinkle our flour. And you notice as I'm sprinkling, I'm kind of like, I have my hand up high and I'm going nice and loose like that. That's gonna come into play here in a few minutes when we actually are turning this into our sheeted pasta. You never wanna clump when you um, sprinkle flour down on pasta, you always wanna sort of lightly, effervescently sort of spray. Um, so in order to get all that puree off the fork, I'm gonna continue to pull that off of there, but also continually reflour my hands so that it doesn't stick to me. And we will do the same thing with our green as we did with our dragon fruit and just start kneading anytime it sticks, a little bit more flour. And you can kind of roll that in the flour, just like so. Up and away, up and away we go. So if you are doing this in a stand mixer, uh, you would probably at this point knead the dough for about four or five minutes. Um, whereas if you're doing it by hand at home, again, I recommend about 10 minutes to really um, develop and stretch out the, the strands of protein, the gluten that is in the dough so that your pasta is nice and supple and elastic. And also ultimately it makes it more al dente, that sort of um, to the tooth, that, uh, that nice texture that you get with pasta where it's soft, but it also is resistant and definitely never mushy. So the more you need, um, the better your texture is gonna be in the resulting pasta. Uh, and if you're, so like I said, stand mixer, probably about five minutes in the stand mixer. If you do it in a food processor, it actually has an even stronger motor and you can do about two and a quarter cups of flour to two thirds of a cup of liquid in a standard size food processor. I wouldn't go a whole lot bigger than that flour wise, um, but in a standard size food processor, so like a five to five to six, seven cup food processor. Uh, and that actually will knead and come together in less than two minutes. So food processor is going to be your fastest bet for making really great pasta dough. Um, by hand, it's gonna be your most romantic and your most zen and your most soothing. Um, okay, so we are just gonna call that good. Let me just give that a couple more needs so that you can see this really great green color kind of come out and pop there. We've got our dragon fruit and our spinach. And I think they look so pretty, don't they? Um, I'm gonna wash my hands very briefly and uh, wrap those both in plastic. And then we're gonna move on to some pasta making here in a moment. If there are any questions, unfortunately, while my back is turned to you, um, I would love to hear them. Anybody have any questions for me on the art of pasta making? Okay, so somebody would like to know what the best type of pasta is for a beginner to jump in and shape. And I am so thrilled and delighted that we have received that question because that's actually the first pasta shape that we're going to make um, right now. So I think what I'm gonna do is actually maybe use well you know what those do need a little bit of time to rest so now rule of thumb is that these would rest for 30 minutes um we'll probably get into them a little bit sooner than that but we are going to make what i consider to be the very best beginner pasta shape right now it's called farfalle um farfalle i'm going to give you a little visual demonstration this is farfalle but i need four hands and then you would really understand what i was doing <laughs> Um, farfalle means butterfly in Italian, um, and that is the first shape we're going to start with. Um, it really, as a beginner pasta shape, 
has a lot of bang for your buck because it's super cool and super fun to shape and relatively easy, but you also can make quite a few of them in a relatively short amount of time. So I'm going to start with, let's see, what do we have here? I think I'm going to start with um, this blue that we did from the butterfly pea flowers, remember, and then um, this other purple that we have here. This one was from the beets and blueberries. And I'm just going to use, I'm going to use of each of those dough colors, um, about ping pong ball size chunks of pasta dough. And so I have a, a sort of... Um, commercial pasta sheeter. And I definitely don't recommend that everybody jump straight into a commercial model unless you're doing lots and lots of volume and production. Um, instead, I really love um, to use hand crank pasta machines. I am going to use the commercial one now because I want, I don't want to waste your time. I want you to get the most out of this in as efficient manner as possible. However, if you are at home um, and looking for a pasta machine um, these hand crank pasta machines are awesome. You can see, I think you can see over there with the camera, they come in an array of colors. They're super cool. They're made um, by Atlas Mercado and you can get whatever color of the rainbow you so desire. Um, but these are really great when you're buying a pasta machine. One thing to look for is just to make sure that these two barrels are evenly calibrated all the way across, like that they would be parallel forever and ever and ever because if they come a little bit too close on one side or the other, that would pull the pasta. And Atlas Marcato does an amazing job of making sure that um, that their equipment is very, um, I mean, they've been making pasta equipment forever. And so they're extremely well made. Um, so I am just going to jump in um, using my commercial pasta machine here just to go a little bit faster. And I'll start on the wider setting with the pasta machine, meaning that those two barrels that I just showed you are farther apart. And as I continue to put the pasta into the machine, those barrels are getting closer and closer and closer together. So we had a ball and now all of a sudden we have sheets of pasta here. So after I get them sheeted through to about the third thinnest setting the first time, I'm gonna fold the pasta onto itself and folding the pasta onto itself like an envelope is called lamination. And the reason that you laminate pasta, so this is what I mean, just folding it onto itself like so. And the reason for doing that is to build up the tensile strength of the pasta dough and to make it um, more toothsome ultimately in the end, so uh, to improve the texture. So I folded it onto itself. I use these two different colors because eventually I'm gonna back these two to each other. So we have dual sided color on our farfalle. Um, but as I folded them, I kind of use them as a guide for each other to make sure that they stay the same size so that in this next step, when I do sandwich them together, they will remain um, the same size. You'll see what I mean in just one second. So back up to a wider setting. I'm gonna go back through the machine. And so normally I would laminate the pasta, meaning fold it onto itself three times. But since I'm just giving a visual demonstration today, I'm just going to do that one lamination and we will sandwich our pasta together. So now I'm just sheeting it out thin enough um, to where I can put it back through the pasta machine. It isn't going to be too wide. And also I want to make sure that these two are more or less the same Size, which I think they're close enough. And if your pasta is on the dry side, you can just use a little bit of water to create a few points on the pasta that will help it to adhere to its other little friend like that, just like that. Okay, so now one purple side, one blue side. And if it's at all sticky, a little bit more flour. Pasta can handle plenty of flour. I actually think that uh, we have a question. What is the biggest mistake that you uh, will see in pasta making from beginners? And it's funny because I'm touching on it right now. More flour, more flour, more flour. People often send me pictures of their pasta and it's torn and it's fallen apart and it's gooey and they say, what's wrong? 
pasta can handle flour. You're really probably not going to over flour it. And so don't be afraid. So more flour is definitely something that um, I would say is one of the bigger mistakes that, uh, that beginner pasta makers often make. And then again, it just, it really does help to understand what that dough texture is supposed to feel like in your hand. Um, and that's something that, um, it, it comes with experience also, um, taking part in things like this, come join me in pasta class, uh, when, when we can meet in person again, but things like this, where you can actually see the pasta, you know, I think, I think this really helps. Okay, so now I've sheeted this out and people often ask, how thin should I sheet the pasta? That's a really hard sentence to say five times fast. How thin should I sheet it? Um, so it depends on the sauce that you're putting it with. If you're gonna do a really delicate, um, nice light sauce, you can sheet very thin to like the second thinnest setting on a pasta machine. But if you're doing something like a bolognese or something that's richer and, and thicker sauce, then you can go a little bit thicker. Um, for reference, I don't know if we can even tell through the live stream, but for reference, this is sheeted to the third thinnest setting on the pasta machine. So I have my two sheets and they are two tone and I just cut them in half. I like to do this so that I remember that I have one half one color and one half the other color. So I'm gonna make a traditional farfalle, which are fluted on the sides and then straight cut across the top and the bottom. So I'm gonna use this fluted rolling cutter here to initially cut straight down the middle. Ooh, it's singing for me, my little um, fluted cutter. Probably needs a little oil. And then I'm gonna cut each side there. I'm gonna go ahead and do both of my sheets here and then cut down the side and down the side like that. And then I'll just remove these scraps. These scraps, incidentally, I will just wrap them right back up um, in plastic, keep them, resheat them, and re-roll them. Don't throw these away. These are still good, good, great pasta. They can be reused. So that's one thing that I love. Um, and actually, it's really cool when you have different colored scraps like this because when you sheet them out through the machine, it almost gives you a tie-dyed or marbled effect. So now I'm just going to cut these farfalle into little rectangles. And so there are um, often sort of size considerations. People are wondering, well, how big should I make the farfalle? And standard is probably about maybe almost two inches wide to about an inch and a half um, high. Uh, however, there's farfalone, big farfalle and farfalline, which are little farfalle. Um, and again, it kind of comes down to what sauce you're pairing it with, um, but also what you would generally consider to be a mouthful. So um, I will say that for beginners, the larger you make the farfalle, the easier they're going to be uh, to pinch. So I'm gonna show you a pinching technique here. So we just use these three fingers and we'll put our index finger in the direct center, our thumb in the bottom center and um, our middle finger up in the top. And then we're just gonna kind of come toward that pointer finger like that and pinch the farfalle like so. And there is in the blue. And then when you get really fast and really good and you have your own pasta rest, you have to make thousands and thousands of thousands. Don't forget you have two hands. You can, you can, you can equally do it with your right and your left hand. Um, I am left-handed and oftentimes in my pasta classes, students will say, oh, I can't do it because I'm left-handed. And I'll say, no, well, first of all, I'm left-handed and second of all, um, Pasta is not a, a dexterous thing. You can, um, you can really do it um, almost just as well with both of your hands. So I always like to try to practice and kind of keep that going. So those are so cute, our little butterflies. I love them. I think they're so pretty. And I also just, I really love the fact that we have two different colors, two tone, turn it over, you know, how fun is that? So in terms of beginner shapes, that question could not have come at a more perfect time because this is my absolute favorite beginner pasta shape. Totally love this. But I want to graduate to our, um, our 200 level class here and show you how to make some stripes. So I think I'm gonna make kind of a 
fun striped sheet and maybe show you a couple of different pasta shapes um, out of that striped sheet. Um, and I have a magical disembodied voice in my ear who I'm going to ask for a time check, please. Okay, so. So flour is a very interesting consideration. Um, we've kind of just gone through an interesting period where flour was relatively difficult to source there for a while. Uh, and so I do like to tell people it's flour. It is not rocket science. You can use whatever flour you have on hand and the pasta will be fine. Um, if you can access a really fancy, you know, amazing um, flour that you that you source that's um, flown over from Italy, that is great. You're going to get a texture that's wonderful because that flour is designed for pasta making, but don't stress too much about it. So um, in terms of considerations for flour, there is a flour called double zero pasta flour. And that would be what I would recommend as the number one best pasta, best flour to use for sheeted pasta like this. So pasta that you would make through a pasta machine like we just um, like we just saw. Um, and the reason why it's so good. So double zero refers to how finely the flour is milled. So there are coarser flours like semolina flour, if you've seen that. And then there are finely milled flours, like almost like like cornstarch would be something that would be considered to be extremely finely milled. Well, double zero, triple zero is the finest, and that's like cornstarch. Double zero is um, the second finest um, uh, milling of pasta flour. Um, and then um, you would go on up to zero, one. One would be considered like an all-purpose flour is about a one two and three. So something like semolina would be coarser and then that would be like a, a three. So double zero is milled very finely and that just helps the ultimate texture of the pasta. Um, and then the other consideration to factor in is the protein content of the flour. So there's double zero pizza flour has a very high protein content and that's because pizza flour is fermented um, over hours, um, usually days. Uh, and you need a high protein content for um, for the yeast to have something to eat its way through as it's de developing, as the gluten is developing. Whereas pasta is unleavened, so you don't necessarily need a high protein um, content in pasta flour because you're not rising it, you're not um, cooking it in high oven temperatures where you would need a, a high protein structure. So ultimately, that was a very long-winded way of saying if you can find it, um, double zero pasta flour or a low protein finely milled flour is going to be your best bet for pasta making. So I am just going to do two different colors of stripes. Oh, and you know, I was going to do, yeah, we're going to do this as our base sheet, but you know what? Then we're going to do three different colors of stripes. We're going to add black into the mix here. Um, so I have multiple balls of pasta dough out here in front of me, and I am making one just a little bit bigger. That's my base sheet and that's just plain pasta dough. And then these three are a little bit smaller pieces of dough. I'm gonna make stripes out of them. So we're gonna go back to our handy dandy pasta machine and start sheeting out the dough. And because if you don't have a pasta machine, um, we had a question. Someone wants to know if you can use a rolling pin. You absolutely can use a rolling pin instead of a pasta machine. Um, you will get a better workout for sure, um, but you will, I think, take a lot more satisfaction in dinner that night. Um, there are also a lot of pasta shapes that you can make if you don't own a pasta machine. Um, and some of them are just some of my favorite pasta shapes, like the cavatellis or the orecchiette or croppie. Um, we are not going to cover those um, in this live stream. However, shapes that don't involve a pasta machine are, it, it's a whole world unto itself and they're amazing. And I would absolutely love to show you sometime. Um, okay, so we did laminate those. 
Yeah, so the question is, do I ever marbleize the colors? And um, a, moment ago, a moment ago, we talked about um, keeping those scraps that you have from all of the colors. And so what happens when you keep the scraps and you sort of put them into a clump and you save them, you know, over the course of your pasta making, and then at the end, when you sheet that out, it becomes a very beautiful, beautiful, like marbleized sort of almost tie dyed look. I'll show you what I mean, because we'll have a few scraps left over from um, from this sheeting session here. So I have my base sheet now. Now I'm going to make stripes out of these accent colors. And I'm just looking essentially now to make these stripes as long as the base sheet. You will see what I mean in just a second. There's that beautiful dragon fruit color coming out, looking awesome. And put our green right over there and get our black. So I don't know if the camera can quite pick this up, but I do want you to see the black was kneaded for a lot longer and then rested for a little bit longer. And the texture of the black is very taut and firm. This is kind of the texture that you're looking for for your pasta dough, whereas you can see, the green is really pulley and really kind of, you know, could stand a little bit more kneading. It's fine for us to work with now, um, but if you have the time, it is probably better to knead your flour for a little bit longer and hopefully you're able to tell with the camera visually why, um, why that's important. I'm just gonna sheet this green through one more time. Just try to build up a little bit more of the strength. So same thing with the reason why you continue to fold the dough onto itself, laminate it, and then put it back through the pasta machine. It just builds up the string. So it's even a little bit better from that one lamination that we did there. So you have a couple of options. Let's see, once this is long enough, for making stripes, you can use just a pasta rolling cutter like this. Um, and I think we have some um, links at the bottom of this live stream, what these um, pasta rolling cutters are, what they kind of look like. There are stainless steel ones, and then um, there are brass ones. Um, you can cut with those, or many pasta machines will have um, attachments that fit onto the front of them. So like those colorful pasta machines that I showed you earlier, they just have a little attachment. It's sort of a smaller version of this attachment here, and it fits right on the front and they usually come in a variety of different widths. So they'll come in a tagliatelle width. Sometimes people call tagliatelle fettuccine. Um, or it will come in um, a, a smaller width. So a tagliarini width, like, which is about like that, almost like a, like a angel hair-ish width. Or I have a, an even wider one, a pappardelle width, which is about like that. And so I'm gonna use the wider stripes here because it's going to look better for you on camera, I would say though, if you're making stripes at home, um, a standard good width would be using the, the fettuccine, the tabiatale cutter. So in order to cut the strips, you literally just put your pasta straight through the machine like so, and voila, you have your strips, which many people would just go on to eat as pappardelle like that but we are going to make fun stripes out of them. Let's see, I'm gonna just stretch that green. Okay. One more go around on the green. That one just needed a little bit more strength to build it up. And we'll cut our strip like so. And So we have another question. Uh, someone is wondering if we cook the pasta immediately or uh, if you should let it rest a little bit. Um, and yes, the answer is you should let the pasta rest and the amount of time that you let it rest will depend on the shape. So the more um, potential for the shape to cave, actually, I'm gonna show you this in the overhead. Um, if this, you know, if the shape can be floppy and if you, when you put it in water, it might, you know, something like that might happen to it then you'll want it to rest longer for like an hour, hour and a half. Um, if it's a shape that's just like, if you're just doing a standard pappardelle or tagliatelle doodle, um, it needs to rest for less time because it doesn't matter really what happens to it in the water. All you're really doing when you're resting the pasta is um, 
reinforcing the shape that you made. Um, so if you're making like tubular shapes, um, rigatoni or garganelli or uh, paketti or something, um, then you'll want it to rest longer so that it will hold that tube or same thing with the farfalle. So it'll hold its pinch. Um, but if it's just a standard flat noodle like this, um, 30 minutes of rest is completely fine. Um, so yes, resting is important. Um, doesn't have to be forever though. Uh, and in my book, um, Pasta Pretty Please, uh, I have all of the shapes um, that I'm showing you right now and also lots, 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 lots more so that you can deep dive into um, the world of pasta shapes as well as the world of pasta colors. So I'm just, as you see, I used a little bit of water um, to make that base sheet ever so slightly tactile so that as I lay these strips down, they have something to adhere to. Um, and I just put the water kind of along the ends just to make absolutely sure that they would stick and then a little bit there in the middle. I don't wanna saturate it with too much water uh, because if I make it too sticky, if it sticks to me, it will stick to the pasta machine when I run it back through there. So back to our green and then we're just laying our stripes. I have never actually done this color combination. It's crazy, I do this all day every day and I'm always finding new things um, that I haven't seen before in pasta and I'm really loving this green fuchsia black kind of combo. I think it's gonna be really awesome when we sheet this out. So as cool as this looks now, or at least I think it looks cool. Oh, look, we messed up. Can we fix it? Yes, we can. Um, as cool as this looks now, we're about to sheet this out into a long flat pasta sheet and it is gonna look even more awesome. So these we're gonna consider the scraps, if you will, but again, not thrown away. So keep that, and when you sheet it out, it just gives that sort of marbled effect that someone earlier asked us about. Someone was said, you know, do you, do you ever make marbled? Well, this sort of makes marbled for you unintentionally. You see you have all these colors. And the great thing about doing a dough like this is that you already um, did all of the work to, um, to laminate it, so you don't even have to laminate it. You can just sheet this through the machine one time and it's awesome. If we have time um, here toward the end of our stream, I'll show you what that will look like. But for now, I wanna sheet this back through the pasta machine so that you can see how cool these stripes come out as. Boy, that dragon fruit, the color just really, really, really pops. I love it. So I'm gonna take this back down to about the third thinness here. Oh my gosh, I'm like deeply loving this color combination. I'm so excited. Thank you for helping me invent something new today, you guys. I love it. Oh, it's so pretty. I need to do just a teeny bit of flower. I'm feeling it stick to me just a little bit, so nice and high and light. And then just wipe it like a baby's bottom. Along there like that. So we have someone just joining us who hasn't been here for the whole live stream. So I'm just going to uh, repeat what the colors are made from. On this particular sheet, we have spinach as our green. Um, we have dragon fruit powder as our fuchsia. And the black comes from activated charcoal. And that is all on top of a classic base um, of, of pasta. But then all of the other colors that you see here do come from vegetables, herbs, and superfoods. I have over 25 different dough recipes in my book, all made from the natural world. So I think it's very cool to see what you can make um, just from nature. So I'm going to show you a few shapes with this. We don't have a whole lot of time left, so I wanna make sure to cover some of my favorites. One of my very favorites is a filled pasta shape called caramelle. And caramelle is Italian for candies. Um, and you'll see why these are called candies in just a second. So similar to um, the farfalle that we made for those of you um, who've been with us the whole time, we're gonna cut using the fluted edges down the side and then straight along. Now, I'm going to pipe filling into this pasta. Um, I have some filling that I made earlier. This is literally just pureed risotto. So I'm um, filling pasta with rice. Um, do I love carbs? Yes, I do. Uh, 
So I have um, just my pureed risotto in my piping bag and I'm gonna just cut the tip there. And now, where am I going to put the filling on this pasta sheet? Am I going to put it on this beautiful colored side of the pasta that I just spent a long time working on? Or am I gonna turn this over and put the filling on the unstriped side? That's what I'm going to do. Remember that, I see that mistake oftentimes in my pasta workshops. So I'm just gonna pipe a little dollop of filling there and then come up and over and then give myself about a half an inch of room, cut a little space and then come up and over again and I'm gonna squeeze into the middle. Remember, we called these candies. Well, right now I'm basically making my little parcel of candies. So then I'm gonna pinch along the sides just like that. So they look just like little candies. Let's make a few of these because these are just my favorites. I love them. So a little dollop of filling. The other cool thing about caramale is um, that they are kind of, they're a bigger pasta shape. So you can actually, if you go to all the trouble to make um, these beautiful patterns, then you don't cut it into something so small that you don't see your pattern in anymore. So, and just kind of press down in the middle. Let's do one more of those. Um, and then the other benefit to making a bigger shape like this is that you don't have to make hundreds of little ravioli. Um, so it's kind of more bang for the buck. I would probably serve five of these on the plate and be done with it. So um, it really is, there are ways to, um, to make even something that seems, um, like it takes a lot of time and effort like this, um, a little bit easier for you. So there we go. There's three beautiful, beautiful caramelle, some of my favorites. So there are some other fun pasta tools um, that I do like, um, little ravioli tools and things. And let's see, let's show you one of those. This is a really cool little um, punch for making ravioli. And boy, I hate to waste that base sheet. Let's take this over here and do this. Let's make a couple of these for you. And we have a question. Pasta dough freezes beautifully. Someone asked us if you can freeze pasta dough. Um, it freezes wonderfully. Uh, one thing that I recommend to people though when freezing pasta dough uh, is to make sure to um, freeze it in smaller pieces. Like this right here is like a four person serving of pasta. Um, I wouldn't necessarily freeze this whole thing. I would cut it with my bench scraper and divide it and freeze it in smaller pieces so that you then can just take out what you actually ultimately wanna eat. So we have our little filling there and then let's just use this handy dandy gadget to make a couple of ravioli, like so, which just look really cool if you have a ravioli punch like this. I think we have one linked down below. Um, but another, yet another way to make filled pasta when you uh, don't have a gadget like that, in fact, have hardly anything, let's see, you have your sheet of pasta like this, and then same thing, I'm gonna just turn this over, I'll do this with the whole other side, and I'm gonna show you Agnolotti. Agnolotti is a filled pasta from Piemonte, um, which is in the north of Italy. It's, um, it's the region where I live, so I happen to be partial to Piemonte, while all of Italy is very beautiful. Um, Piemonte makes some of the best pasta, those are my fighting words. Um, so I'm just gonna pipe two lines of filling um, close to the outer edge of that pasta, machine, pasta sheet. And I'm gonna take my pasta, come up and over like so one time, making sort of a tube, and then a second time. So it kind of comes together like that. And then at this point, I'm gonna cut down the center. I'm gonna use the fluted cutter. Um, on annulotti, it's especially important to use the fluted cutter when you make the shapes of annulotti. You'll see why, but I'll tell you, um, it is because the fluted cutter um, crimps as well as cuts. Whereas if you just use the straight cutter, it, uh, it only cuts the dough. And so I will show you right now why that fluting is important. So see with these little parcels here, you need them to be able to be to be completely sealed 
on the sides like that. So those just become like little, I think they're like little, little pillows, little pasta pillows. And they're just oh, one of my very favorite shapes. And you'll notice with doing something like the annulotti, this is how much I have left over, which I can again, resheet, rewrap, reroll and resheet. Um, whereas when we, um, when we punched out those ravioli, for example, you have the whole perimeter around the ravioli that is the, um, that's the extra pasta. So um, in terms of space and economy and efficiency, uh, the annulotti really is, I always have to turn this so that I can pinch my left-handed from left to right way. Um, so this is probably about the last pasta shape that I have time to show you guys today. Again, all these shapes are in my book, Pasta Pretty Please, um, link down below. Uh, but if there are any last minute questions, I would love to take them now. Anybody have anything that they're wondering, any burning desires or questions? If there aren't any, I'm gonna address one final thing. Um, very important consideration is how long do you boil the pasta? So we have several different pasta shapes here lined up and they're all very different. And they all have different amounts of filling um, and you know different kind of like size ratios. Well, when you're boiling something like the farfalle that we made first, um, that doesn't have any filling in it and it's very thin and delicate. So that's gonna boil for a much shorter time. Whereas when we're trying to cook all of the filling, make sure it heats all the way through in the caramelle, which would be our larger um, pasta pieces, uh, that's going to have to boil for a little bit longer. Um, so I usually tell people to test one first, just one, uh, and then pull that out of the water. And then that's when you'll get your boil time. But in general, fresh pasta boils much faster than a box of dried pasta. So we're talking one to four minutes. Four minutes would be like an absolute max. Um, whereas with dried pasta, you know, you're looking at seven, eight, nine, even 12 minute boil time sometimes. Um, but you don't wanna do all this work and then have your pasta disintegrate into the water. And also your colors will hold more the less amount of time that you boil them. So do bear in mind as my, as my parting gift to you, um, boil pasta for fresh pasta for a very short amount of time. Your colors will hold vibrantly and you'll still have that really nice al dente texture. So any final questions? If we don't have any questions, um, I am going to say arrivederci for now. Uh, again, I'm Linda with Salty Seattle, and I had so much fun with you. You guys can find me on uh, social media, and then also I have a, an Amazon page here. So um, I love answering questions after the fact. Um, send me an email, shoot me a message, and I would be happy to talk pasta, pasta products, pasta dresses. I make those too. Um, pasta everything with you. Um, I had so much fun with you guys, and I hope we get to do it again soon. Arrivederci.